Well, first off, thank you for coming out on this very, very chilly Sunday morning. It is wonderful to see you. And happy Valentine's Day. So, yep, happy Valentine's Day. So give yourselves a hand for coming out. And the reason that I say that is because there are three holidays every year that really speak to what New Thought is all about. Valentine's Day is one of them. The others are Independence Day and Thanksgiving, which is one of our favorites. But Valentine's Day is an opportunity to get completely lost in candy hearts and pithy sayings and the distractions of what romantic love is supposed to look like. And it can also be an invitation to get connected with the truth of the love that we are in every moment. So, if you haven't heard it clearly before, happy Valentine's Day. I'm delighted to see the love that's in you. So we're doing postcard talks. This is our second postcard talk, and you should have a postcard that you got with it, with your program today. Um, the postcard talk today is, I love Stephen Singer <laughs> and all of God's creation. So if you've lived in Philadelphia for any period of time, you've seen the billboards that say, I hate Stephen Singer, and he's on the radio all the time with, I hate Stephen Singer. And um, if you don't know the story, I will spoil the surprise for you. Stephen Singer is a jeweler. He's on Jewelry Row. And um, the story is that somebody came in and bought an anniversary diamond something for his wife. And nine months later, they had another baby. This was on their 23rd anniversary. And she says, I love Stephen Singer. He says, I hate Stephen Singer. So he turned that into a marketing campaign. And that's wonderful. Marketing messages are wonderful because they're supposed to catch your attention. They're supposed to be provocative and cute. And they're supposed to invite somebody to the next step. So there's billboards all over town that say, I hate Stephen Singer, and I hate Stephen Singer .com, or to get somebody to go and say, what is this all about? So they then can start building their rapport with the jewelry store. OK, great. But I have to tell you something about the nature of truth and using your word impeccably. Stephen Singer does not want to be about hate. So what he's doing in that campaign is he's claiming something that's a non-truth because it's going to get him something else. Now, I have spent some time in my career as an advertising copywriter. And I did direct response marketing for quite a long time. And <clears throat> by far, the most effective campaign that I ever sent out was one that looked like it was a letter coming from a lawyer threatening that somebody was going to get sued by the government for $100,000 if they didn't do what we told them. That was really sad. Because there were a lot of other really good reasons to do business with this company, but the most effective one was the threat. I don't do that anymore. <coughs> and there are people in the world who still do that. If you listen to WMMR, you'll hear Stephen Singer. He's made himself a little celebrity. He's on with Howard Stern all the time. And that's what he's doing for his business. And I can't do that anymore. When I was a zany radio disc jockey, I would make fun of people. That was my job. I can't do that anymore. I can still be funny, but it's not at other people's expense. Why not? Why am I not comfortable doing that? Why can't I put up a campaign that says, I hate Stephen Singer? It's because I don't want to be about hate. It's because I understand the value and the importance of my word and setting my intention and speaking my truth. So I'd find a way to say that in a different way to make the same message come through without having to claim something that's not true that I don't want about myself. So we've had a whole bunch of people in the community going through various medical procedures. You heard the story about Joe and her hip replacement and our friend Mike got his uh, bicep and his rotator cuff fixed this week and they had to do more work than they thought. So you know, good news, bad news is, wow, they had to do more work. But the good part is he's now going to recuperate and have full use of his arm again. But what I noticed as I was going through, I got some diagnostic testing done this week, is they call it the healthcare industry. So I go to a doctor to talk about my health, and they send me for a test. And if it turns out that that illness is present, they call the result positive. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not the result I'm looking for. So. In the language that I'm having with my medical professionals, I don't, that's not health care. That's disease care. They're looking for a disease. I don't want them to be looking for a disease. I want them to be looking for me to be healthy. So I'm anticipating the reports coming back that the diagnosis is that I'm healthy. I'm not looking for positive or negative or whatever it is that they're calling because I want to stand in my truth and claim what it is that I'm looking for. And unfortunately, 
That sort of verbal abuse goes on all the time. Now, if you've heard about verbal abuse, it's, it's bullying and it's name calling, it's demeaning people, it's ridiculing them, it's yelling. So there's a, a large movement in the, in the country that's about getting rid of verbal abuse. It's not just physical abuse that's in relationships where people are verbally abusive to other people. And there's definitely violent language. And we have a whole program that we get involved in here called um, uh, nonviolent communication, which is another one of those words that's, I'm sorry, we're talking about what we want to do by talking about what we don't want to do. It shouldn't be nonviolent communication. It should be some other sort of communication. So I'm going to violent communication over here and I want to do something else. I don't want to be nonviolent because then I'm still talking about violent communication. So the term that we're trying to use is compassionate communication or loving communication. Talking somebody into loving communication. Well, <laughs> if you're in an argument, they're going to insist that it is loving communication and you're just doing something wrong. <laughs> and then go right back into the abusive part of it. But that verbal abuse goes so far beyond that individual, somebody intentionally saying something undermining or mean. And this is, this is something that, that in my family we've been grappling with for a long time, is there will be people of authority who will describe a problem or a situation or an issue, and they'll use the second person. They will say, you have this, or you have that. Or when this happens, then you have this, and this happens to your kidneys, and this happens to your liver, and this happens to your... And they're talking about it in the second person as though, when I'm listening to it, they're talking about my kidneys. They're talking about my liver. They're talking about my something or other. And that's just not true. I have a really difficult time giving examples of this because I want to hear it on the radio. It's like an assault on me. So I spend, and I'll talk about the techniques that we use to get away from that. But I'll give you some completely preposterous examples. So when somebody's bitten, when you're bitten on the foot by a dragon, your foot swells up to the size of a balloon, and then you experience this, and you experience shaking, and this and that and the other thing. And I'm okay saying that because I don't think you're going to get bitten by a dragon. You know, a similar thing happens when you kiss a cartoon princess. Okay, little butterflies float out of your ears and there's spinning stars that come out of your head and there's a swooning that you do. I don't think you're going to kiss a cartoon princess either, so don't worry about that. But it's where those people who are talking to us can speak authoritatively as though they know and then they're going to tell us what's going to happen to us. When somebody does that to me and I notice it, the first thing I have to do is say cancel. This is not about me, they're speaking about somebody else. And the worst part is when it's an interesting or compelling story or report that's on the news. Because they've got this professional that's sitting there telling everybody that you're going to have this because it's cold and flu season. Or you're going to have that because of, you know, the, what's it, the Zika virus. And that might be possible for some people, but I don't necessarily have to volunteer and participate in that. So the first thing I need to do is say, they're not talking about me. So I'm dodging out of the way of whatever it is that they're saying. And that, for me, it makes it a little, it's a little distracting. I can't follow the story. At some point, a lot of them, <clears throat> I just have to turn it off because of the way that they're telling the story. I'll give you a personal example. <clears throat> Probably 10 years ago, I went to uh, my highly regarded ophthalmologist. And she checked my eyes, and my vision was fine. And she said, yeah, but when you turn 50, you're going to need reading glasses. And it's like. What are you saying? <laughs> that is nonsense. That's not necessarily true. I know lots of men who are well past 50 who don't have reading glasses. And I told her that. And she says, yeah, but you're going to need reading glasses. And it's like, would you stop saying that? Because she's speaking as the highly authoritative ophthalmologist telling me what she thinks my truth is going to be. And I kept on telling her to stop doing that. And defended myself against it, and the next time I went and saw her, she did the same thing again, so I stopped seeing her. Because <laughs> I don't want to be defending myself against my healthcare professionals. But unfortunately, she hooked my attention. So now I use reading glasses. <laughs> and I'm not blaming it on her. She was doing what she was doing, and there's this entire field of consciousness. We call it race consciousness, which is what everybody believes together. 
And what I believe is part of that race consciousness. I mean, that's what we're talking about all the time here, is that there's one power and presence, one infinite love, one intelligence, and it shows up as all sorts of different things. It shows up as each of us. And the good news is we can create our own experience, and that's what we keep talking about here. And the challenging part is that when we buy into a belief that's not necessarily true or not necessarily helpful, even if it came from somebody who's well-trained and well-meaning, we can get hooked into a belief that's not necessarily true for us, and then we get to live out that belief, because it does become true for us. <clears throat> so what I'm working on is the notion of what I call spiritual Aikido. Now, Aikido is uh, the, 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 the martial art that's not about attacking. It's about taking the attacker's motion and turning it to, 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 to use their own activity and their motion against them. So it's about ducking out of the way, it's about using pressure points and moves, and it's possible for somebody who's adept at Aikido, they, they can, just can't be touched by somebody else attacking them. Because what happens is they get out of the way. So spiritual Aikido, which is what we're working on, is that process of understanding when that attack is going on. That's the first step, is noticing that it's happening to recognize that somebody in authority is now saying stuff that I don't necessarily want to be believing, that I don't necessarily think is true now, and I certainly don't want to open myself up to the possibility of. When somebody on the radio or TV is talking about it being cold and flu season, and that means that I'm going to need NyQuil, I've said this before, I will say it again. I've had a cold before, I've had it during cold and flu season. I've also had a cold before, not during cold and flu season. So I gotta believe that the cold germs don't know when they're in season. <laughs> they're available during the summer. Oh, it was a summer cold, so it was an out of season cold, but it was the same germ. Okay, if they don't know when the season is, then why should I care when the season is? The other thing that we say very clearly is when somebody becomes sick with a cold, they caught a cold. And I think of catching a cold the same as catching a bus. Now I've seen the 23 bus go by lots and lots of times. And I've never gotten on it. I've never caught the 23 bus because I didn't need to. It didn't have anything to do with where I was going or where I needed to get to. And in the same way, when a cold germ comes along, we don't have to catch it. We can let it go by because we don't need to be on that particular bus or having that particular experience. So the whole notion of somebody telling me that it's cold and flu season so something is going to happen to me is nonsense. And that's what Ernest Holmes meant when he said we, we can look a fact in the face and know something better. But in spiritual Aikido, the first step is to notice that it's happening, to notice that there's some idea that's being projected upon us that we don't necessarily resonate with, that we don't want to accept. The second step is to rephrase it or to pivot. So when somebody says it's cold and flu season, I can recognize that it's not cold and flu season for me or that cold and flu season doesn't apply, it doesn't actually change my experience. Whatever it is that I'm going to do to change that language. Now, if it's somebody on the radio talking about you know, an, an epidemic, you know, Ebola, it's coming to your town, because <sighs> they love doing that, and it's sensational when they say it in the second person, you're going to have this, and you're going to get that, and you're going to be the other way, and the rest of it can, it can be terrifying, and of course it gets great ratings. But I want to pivot and say, that's not about me. There is that, that, that illness, that malady, that possibility out there, but it doesn't apply to me. So I'm going to step out of the way and let that one go by. And do that until you get to the point where it's just, you spend all your time saying cancel, cancel, not true, not about me, <sighs> at which point you get to change the channel or something like that. The third part, and this is the part that I'm not really sure how to do, we've tried it a few times in a few different ways, is to stop the attack. To tell the person who's doing it, if we're face to face with them, can you please stop talking in the second person? The things that you're talking about are wonderful. They're an experience that you know, the person talking had been having, but they're talking about it as though I'm having it. It's like, no, you're the one who just had surgery. Don't tell me about what happened during your surgery as though it applies to me. And sometimes they get it, and sometimes they don't get it. The people who really love you and care about you, and especially the ones who understand this teaching, are more likely to say, oh, I get it. I understand what you want me to do. So you can invite them to stop doing that. 
the times when it's really difficult, my daughter dealt with this a lot when she was in high school. Some of her teachers would stand in front of the class and they would do this to an entire classroom full of students. Tell them about the maladies of the world and how horrible this is going to be. She got into college, she was a journalism student and every class began with a journalism professor saying, well, you're in a horrible career field because you're not going to be able to get a job because the jobs for people who are in journalism don't exist anymore, so you're going to be screwed when you get out of school. And it's like, first of all, why are we paying tuition for this? <laughs> and second of all, that doesn't have to be true for her. So she spent a lot of time doing that spiritual Aikido to jump out of the way of that. Oh, P.S. She got a really good job in journalism right out of school. <laughs> And that was just a coincidence. <laughs> or not. The other thing that you can do that's really important is later, you can pray for peace and harmony and to know the truth about yourself and the situation that you're in. And the prayer part is wonderful because you can clear out whatever that stuff is that's been going on. If somebody has been speaking voodoo to you and you have inadvertently been collecting it up, then you can discharge that and go back to knowing the truth about who you are, which is that divine expression of God's love, not limited by some outside force, regardless of how authoritatively that person was speaking, with their medical degrees and their very expensive appointments and all their machinery and all the other stuff that they have going on, whatever that situation is. So this is very much a work in progress. Um, I, I, I do not have it mastered at this point. You know, there's still people who call Compassionate communication, nonviolent communication. So it's a work in progress. But uh, Morihei Ueshiba, who was the founder of Aikido, said that to control aggression without inflicting injury is the art of peace. Mm -hmm. I like that, the art of peace. So there's a way that we can practice the art of peace because in that process there's no attacking. The only time that we're actually interacting with the other person is if we're asking them to change their behavior so that they're being more positive and straightforward. And when I say positive, I mean good, happy results, not positive, this is the horrible thing we were expecting, and now we've shown that that positivity is actually a negative experience showing up in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> huh. So practice spiritual Aikido even if you just do the first step of noticing, of noticing when something is happening, of noticing when somebody is saying something, they're claiming a truth about you that you don't necessarily claim for yourself. Because it might be true, or it might not be true. The part to focus on is that the truth about you, right then and in every moment, is that you are a divine and perfect expression of love. You are love. You repeat that to yourself. I am love, I am harmony, I am peace, I am health, right here, right now, and always. You are a blessing. Have a very happy Valentine's Day.